At Salesforce, we're all about asking more of AI. Questions like, where's the data going? Is it secure? Are you sure? Are you sure you're sure? Get answers you can trust from Salesforce at askmoreofai.com. A word now from Children's Dimatap. Life with kids is chaotic, in the best way. But colds add an unwelcome layer to that joyful family chaos. Children's Dimatap is a pharmacist-recommended brand trusted by parents for over 50 years. It actually tastes like real grape, so it's yuck-free, and it provides fast-acting relief for cough, cold, and allergy symptoms. Get back to your regularly scheduled chaos with Children's Dimatap. Learn more at Dimatap.com. Use as directed. Join me, 48 Hours correspondent Erin Moriarty, on my podcast, My Life of Crime, as I take on true crime investigations like no other. This season, I'm looking into the labyrinth of crime and secrets within families. I'm cutting straight to the evidence and talking to the people directly involved, including investigators and the families of victims. Listen to My Life of Crime with Erin Moriarty wherever you get your podcasts. Welcome to Scare You to Sleep. I'm your host, Shelby Scott. You know, one of my favorite genres of horror movies is comedy horror. Tucker and Dale vs. Evil, Shaun of the Dead, Happy Death Day, stuff like that. And I have to admit, for some reason, I was under the impression that comedy horror was more of a modern genre. And while it may be more popular now, I am so happy to find out that I was wrong about it being a newish thing. I came across this week's story recently, and I was so incredibly delighted by the levity and wit that just dripped from every page. Of course, the humor is old-timey, considering this was written sometime in 1911 or earlier, but it's still so much fun, and I think it's a great one to take us into the Halloween season. This story was written by Richard Middleton author, and from what I could gather, a bi-icon, who was sadly plagued by depression and took his own life at the young age of 29. That's why I'm not really sure when the story was written exactly. It wasn't published until a year after his death in 1912, and even then, it didn't really pick up much popularity until the 1930s when it was reprinted. I don't know much about Richard, but he feels like a kindred spirit of mine from a different time. So this week, I wanted to honor him and the underrated genre of comedy horror by reading you his story, Ghost Ship. Fairfield is a little village lying near Portsmouth Road, about halfway between London and the sea. Strangers who find it by accident now and then call it a pretty old-fashioned place. We who live in it and call it home don't find anything very pretty about it, but we should be sorry to live anywhere else. Our minds have taken the shape of the inn and the church and the green, I suppose. At all events, we never feel comfortable out of Fairfield. Of course, the Cockneys, with their vasty houses and noise-ridden streets, can call us rustics if they choose. But for all that, Fairfield is a better place to live than London. Doctor says that when he goes to London, his mind is bruised with the weight of the houses, and he was a Cockney-born. He had to live there himself when he was a little chap, but he knows better now. You gentlemen may laugh, perhaps some of you come from London Way, but it seems to me that a witness like that 
is worth a gallon of arguments. Dull? Well, you might find it dull. But I assure you that I've listened to all the London yarns you've spun tonight, and they are absolutely nothing to the things that happen at Fairfield. It's because of our way of thinking and minding our own business. If one of your Londoners were set down on the green of a Saturday night when the ghosts of the lads who died in the war keep tryst with the lasses who lie in the churchyard, he couldn't help being curious and interfering, and then the ghosts would go somewhere where it was quieter. But we just let them come and go, and don't make any fuss. And in consequence, Fairfield is the ghostiest place in all England. Why, I've seen a headless man sitting on the edge of the well in broad daylight, and the children playing about his feet as if he were their father. Take my word for it, spirits know when they are well off, as much as human beings. Still, I must admit that the thing I'm going to tell you about was queer even for our part of the world, where three packs of ghost towns hunt regularly during the season, and the blacksmith's great-grandfather is busy all night shoeing the dead gentleman's horses. Now, that's a thing that wouldn't happen in London, because of their interfering ways. But blacksmith, he lies up aloft and sleeps as quiet as a lamb. Once, when he had had a bad head, he shouted down to them not to make so much noise, and in the morning, he found an old guinea left on the anvil, as an apology. He wears it on his watch chain now. But I must get on with my story. If I start telling you about the queer happenings at Fairfield, I'll never stop. It all came of the great storm in the spring of 97. The year that we had two great storms. This was the first one, and I remember it very well because I found in the morning that it had lifted the thatch of my pigsty into the widow's garden as clean as a boy's kite. When I looked over the hedge, widow, Tom Lamport's widow, that was, was prodding for her nasturtiums with the daisy grubber. After I had watched her for a little, I went down to the fox and grapes to tell the landlord what she had said to me. Landlord, he laughed, being a married man and at ease with the sex. Come to that, he said. The tempest has blowed something into my field. A kind of ship, I think it would be. I was surprised at that, until he explained that it was only a ghost ship and would do no hurt to the turnips. We argued that it had been blown up from the sea at Portsmouth, and then we talked of something else. There were two slates down at the parsonage and a big tree in Lumley's Meadow. It was a rare storm. I reckon the wind had blown our ghosts all over England. They were coming back for days afterwards, with foundered horses and as footsore as possible. And they were so glad to get back to Fairfield that some of them walked up the street crying like little children. Squire said that his great-grandfather's great-grandfather hadn't looked so deadbeat since the Battle of Naseby, and he's an educated man. What with one thing and another? I should think it was a week before we got straight again. And then, one afternoon, I met the landlord on the green, and he had a worried face. I wish you'd come and have a look at the ship in my field, he said to me. It seems to me it's leaning real hard on the turnips. I can't bear to think what the missus will say when she sees it. I walked down the lane with him, and sure enough... There was a ship in the middle of his field, but such a ship as no man had seen on the water for three hundred years, let alone in the middle of a turnip field. It was all painted black and covered with carvings, and there was a great bay window in the stern for all the world like the squire's drawing room. There was a crowd of little black cannon on the deck and looking at her portholes and she was anchored at each end to the hard ground. I have seen the wonders of the world on picture postcards, but I have never seen anything to equal that. She seems very solid for a ghost ship, I said, 
seeing the landlord was bothered. I should say it's a betwixt and between, he answered, puzzling it over. But it's going to spoil a matter of fifty turnips, and Mrs. She'll want it moved. We went up to her and touched the side, and it was as hard as a real ship. Now, there's folks in England who call that very curious, he said. Now, I don't know much about ships, but I should think that ghost ship weighed a solid two hundred tons, and it seemed to me that she had come to stay, so that I felt sorry for the landlord, who was a married man. All the horses in Fairfield won't move her out of my turnips, he said, frowning at her. Just then, we heard a noise on her deck, and we looked up, and we saw that a man had come out of her front cabin and was looking down at us very peaceably. He was dressed in a black uniform, set out with rusty gold lace, and he had a great cutlass by his side in a brass sheath. I'm Captain Bartholomew Roberts, he said in a gentleman's voice. Put in for recruits. I seem to have brought her rather far up the harbor. Harbor? cried the landlord. Why, you're fifty miles from the sea! Captain Roberts didn't turn a hair. So much as that, is it? He said coolly. Well, it's of no consequence. Landlord was a bit upset at this. I don't want to be unneighborly, he said. But I wish you hadn't brought your ship into my field. You see, my wife sets great store on these turnips. The captain took a pinch of snuff out of a fine gold box that he pulled out of his pocket and dusted his fingers with a silk handkerchief in a very genteel fashion. I'm only here for a few months, he said. But if a testimony of my esteem would pacify your good lady, I should be content. And with the words, he loosed a great gold brooch from the neck of his coat and tossed it down to the landlord. Landlord blushed as red as a strawberry. I'm not denying she's fond of jewelry, he said. But it's too much for half a sack full of turnips. And indeed, it was a handsome brooch. The captain laughed. <laughs> Tut, Tut, man, he said. It's a it's forced a sale, sale, and you deserved a good price. price. Say no Say more no about, about it. it. And, nodding good day to us, he turned on his heel and went into the cabin. Landlord walked back up the lane like a man with a weight off his mind. That tempest has blowed me a bit of luck, he said. The missus will be much pleased with the brooch. It's better than the blacksmith's guinea, any day. 97 was a jubilee year, the year of the second jubilee. You remember, and we had great doings at Fairfield, so that we hadn't much time to bother about the ghost ship, Though, anyhow, it isn't our way to meddle in things that don't concern us. Landlord, he saw his tenant once or twice when he was hoeing his turnips and passed the time of day, and Landlord's wife wore her new brooch to church every Sunday. But we don't mix much with the ghosts at any time. All except an idiot lad there was in the village, and he didn't know the difference between a man and a ghost, poor innocent. On Jubilee Day, however, somebody told Captain Roberts why the church bells were ringing, and he hoisted a flag and fired off his guns like a loyal Englishman. Tis true, the guns were shotted, and one of the round shot a hole in Farmer Johnstone's barn, but nobody thought much of that in such a season of rejoicing. It wasn't until our celebrations were over that we noticed that anything was wrong in Fairfield. 
"'Twas Shoemaker, who told me first about it one morning at the Fox and Grapes. "'You know my great-uncle,' he said to me. "'You mean Joshua, the quiet lad?' I answered, knowing him well. "'Quiet!' said the shoemaker indignantly. "'Quiet, you call him, coming home at three o'clock every morning, "'as drunk as a magistrate, and waking the whole house with his noise.' It can't be Joshua, I said, for I knew him to be one of the most respectable young ghosts in the village. Joshua, it is, said Shoemaker, and one of these nights, he'll find himself out in the street if he isn't careful. This kind of talk shocked me, I can tell you, for I don't like to hear a man abusing his own family and I could hardly believe that a steady youngster like Joshua had taken to drink. But just then, in came Butcher Eilwyn, in such a temper that he could hardly drink his beer. The young puppy! The young puppy! He kept on saying. And it was some time before Shoemaker and I found out he was talking about his ancestor that fell at Senlac. Drink, said Shoemaker hopefully. For we all like company in our misfortunes. And Butcher nodded grimly. The young noodle, he said, emptying his tankard. Well, after that, I kept my ears open. And it was the same story all over the village. There was hardly a young man among the ghosts of Fairfield who didn't roll home in the small hours of the morning, the worse for liquor. I used to wake up in the night and hear them stumble past my house singing outrageous songs. The worst of it was that we couldn't keep the scandal to ourselves, and the folk at Greenhill began to talk of sodden Fairfield and taught their children to sing a song about us. Sodden Fairfield, sodden Fairfield has no use for bread and butter. Rum for breakfast, rum for dinner, rum for tea, and rum for supper. We are easy going in our village. But we didn't like that. Of course, we soon found out where the young fellows went to get the drink, and Landlord was terribly cut up that his tenant should have turned out so badly. But his wife wouldn't hear of parting with the brooch. So he couldn't give the captain notice to quit. But time went on. Things grew from bad to worse. And at all hours of the day, you would see those young reprobates sleeping it off on the village green. Nearly every afternoon, a ghost wagon used to jolt down to the ship with a lading of rum. And though the older ghosts seemed inclined to give the captain's hospitality the go-by, the youngsters were neither to hold nor to bind. So one afternoon, when I was taking my nap, I heard a knock at the door. And there was the parson looking very serious, like a man with a job before him that he didn't altogether relish. I'm going down to talk to the captain about all this drunkenness in the village, and I want you to come with me, he said straight out. I can't say that I fancied this visit much myself, and I tried to hint to the parson that is, after all, they were only a lot of ghosts, It didn't very much matter. Dead or alive, I'm responsible for the good conduct, he said. And I'm going to do my duty and put a stop to this continued disorder. And you are coming with me, John Simmons. So, I went, Parson being a persuasive kind of man. We went down to the ship. And as we approached her, I could see the captain tasting the air on deck. When he saw Parson, he took off his hat very politely, and I can tell you that I was relieved to find that he had a proper respect for the cloth. Parson acknowledged his salute, and spoke out stoutly enough. Sir, I should be glad to have a word with you. Come on board, sir. Come on board said the captain, and I could tell by his voice that he knew why we were there. 
Parson and I climbed up an uneasy kind of ladder, and the captain took us into the great cabin at the back of the ship, where the bay window was. It was the most wonderful place you ever saw in your life, all full of gold and silver plate, swords with jeweled scabbards, carved oak chairs, and great chests that looked as though they were bursting with guineas. Even Parson was surprised, and he did not shake his head very hard when the captain took down some silver cups and poured us out a drink of rum. I tasted mine, and I don't mind saying that it changed my view of things entirely. There was nothing betwixt and between about that rum. And I felt that it was ridiculous to blame the lads for drinking too much of stuff like that. It seemed to fill my veins with honey and fire. Parson put the case squarely to the captain. But I didn't listen much to what he said. I was busy sipping my drink and looking through the window at the fishes swimming to and fro over the landlord's turnips. Just then... It seemed the most natural thing in the world that they should be there. Though afterwards, of course, I could see that that proved it was a ghost ship. But even then, I thought it was queer when I saw a drowned sailor float by in the thin air with his hair and beard all full of bubbles. It was the first time I had seen anything quite like that at Fairfield. All the time I was regarding the wonders of the deep, Parson was telling Captain Roberts how there was no peace or rest in the village owing to the curse of drunkenness, and what a bad example the youngsters were setting to the older ghosts. The captain listened very attentively, and only put in a word now and then about boys being boys and young men sowing their wild oats. But when Parson had finished his speech... He filled our silver cups and said to Parson with a flourish, I I should be sorry sorry to cause trouble trouble anywhere anywhere where where I have been made welcome. welcome. And And you will be glad glad to hear that I put to sea tomorrow tomorrow night. night. And And now, you must must drink drink me a prosperous voyage. So we all stood up and drank the toast with honor. And that noble rum was like hot oil in my veins. After that, Captain showed us some of the curiosities he had brought back from foreign parts, and we were greatly amazed. Though, afterwards, I couldn't clearly remember what they were, and then I found myself walking across the turnips with Parson, and I was telling him of the glories of the deep, that I had seen through the windows of the ship. He turned on me severely. If I were you, John Simmons, he said, I should go straight home to bed. He has a way of putting things that wouldn't occur to a normal man, has Parson, and I did as he told me. Hey there, it's the new year. You've got mood boards and resolutions and work is back in full swing and you don't need any extra stress in your life. And Factor's ready-to-eat meal delivery takes the stress out of meal planning and sets you up for success in the new year. Skip the grocery stores, prep work, and cooking fatigue. Instead, get chef-crafted, dietitian approved meals delivered right to your door with over 35 meals to choose from per week, including options like keto, calorie smart, vegan plus veggie, and more. Plus over 55 weekly add-ons, you'll have a ton of nutritious and flavorful options to kickstart your resolutions. Forget frantic lunch preps and rush dinners. Factor's two-minute meals are your secret weapon in the new year. Fuel up fast with restaurant-quality meals, all delivered right to your door. Factor now offers loads of snack options like breakfast, smoothies, juices, snacks, and more to keep me going no matter what's on the schedule. Skip the overpriced takeout trap. 
Factor is cheaper and way more delicious than takeout. Get chef-crafted, restaurant-quality meals delivered right to your door. They are ready to heat and eat in just two minutes, which means more time for you. Need a special occasion meal? Gourmet Plus is the perfect solution if you're looking for fast, upscale options done easily. When things get hectic, Factor is flexible. Change up your order every week with plans from 4 to 18 meals per week. Or pause or reschedule your deliveries anytime. Stress less over mealtimes in the new year. Factor's no prep, no mess meals free up time otherwise spent on shopping, cooking, and cleanup. No more wasting time in the kitchen. Not only does Factor offer fast, simple solutions when I'm too busy to cook, they also help me stay on top of my goals. With offerings like Protein Plus and Keto, I can stay on track. This is definitely going to come in handy for my New Year's goals. Factor has everything I need for a week of flavorful, nutritious eats. In addition to ready-to-eat meals, they have cold-pressed juices, smoothies, energy bites, extra protein, veggie sides, and more to keep me energized during frantic times. Head to factormeals.com slash scareyoutosleep50 and use code scareyoutosleep50 to get 50% off. That's code scare you to sleep 50 at factormeals.com. As many scary to sleep fans know, I've been going through a lot of changes in my life. And one thing I've been doing is getting my finances much more organized, and that includes paring down some of the subscriptions I pay for. It feels like everything is a subscription these days, be it for the gym or streaming services or music, the list goes on and on. And something that has helped me tremendously is rocket money. They not only helped me cancel subscriptions that were a pain to try to do myself. Have you ever tried to deal with some of these companies directly? It's just a headache. Rocket Money also alerts me when the subscriptions I did keep go up in price, giving me the ability to weigh my options and keep those little extras that add up oh so quickly in check. Rocket Money is a personal finance app that finds and cancels your unwanted subscriptions, monitors your spending, and helps lower your bills. I can see all of my subscriptions in one place, and if I see something I don't want, I can cancel it with a tap. I never have to get on the phone with customer service. Rocket Money has over 5 million users and has helped save its members an average of $720 a year with over 500 million in canceled subscriptions. Stop wasting money on things you don't use. Cancel your unwanted subscriptions by going to rocketmoney.com slash scare you to sleep. That's rocketmoney.com slash scare you to sleep. Rocketmoney.com slash scare you to sleep. Don't just ride the index. Seek to outperform it with Fidelity Active ETFs. Learn more at fidelity.com slash active ETFs. Before investing in any exchange-traded fund, you should consider its investment objectives, risks, charges, and expenses. Contact Fidelity for a prospectus, an offering circular, or if available, a summary prospectus containing this information. Read it carefully. While active ETFs offer the potential to outperform an index, these products may more significantly trail an index as compared with passive ETFs. Fidelity Brokerage Services, LLC, member NYSE, SIPC. Well, next day, it came on to blow, and it blew harder and harder, till about eight o'clock at night. I heard a noise and looked out into the garden. I dare say you won't believe me. It seems a bit tall, even to me. But the wind had lifted the thatch of my pigsty into the widow's garden a second time. I thought I wouldn't wait to hear what the widow has to say about it, so I went across the green to the fox and grapes, and the wind was so strong that I danced along on tiptoe like a girl at the fair. When I got to the inn, landlord had to help me shut the door. It seemed as though a dozen goats were pushing against it to come in out of the storm. It's a powerful tempest, he said, drawing the beer. I hear there's a chimney down at Dickory End. It's a funny thing how these sailors know about the weather, I answered. When Captain said he was going tonight, I was thinking it would take a cap full of wind to carry the ship back to sea. But now here's more than a cap full. Oh, yes, said Landlord. It's tonight he goes true enough. And mind you, though he treated me handsome over the rent, I'm not sure it's a loss to the village. 
I don't hold with gentrice who fetch their drink from London instead of helping local traders to get their living. <laughs> but you haven't got any rum like his, I said, to draw him out. His neck grew red above his collar, and I was afraid I'd gone too far. But after a while, he got his breath with a grunt. John Simmons, he said, if you've come down here this windy night to talk a lot of fool's talk, you've wasted a journey. Well, of course, then I had to smooth him down with praising his rum and heaven forgive me for swearing it was better than captain's. For the like of that rum, no living lips have tasted, save mine and Parsons. But somehow or other, I brought Landlord round, and presently we must have a glass of his best to prove its quality. Beat that if you can, he cried, and we both raised our glasses to our mouths, only to stop halfway and look at each other in a maze. For the wind that had been howling outside like an outrageous dog had all of a sudden turned as melodious as the carol boys of a Christmas Eve. Surely that's not my Martha, whispered Landlord, Martha being his great aunt that lived in the loft overhead. We went to the door and the wind burst it open so that the handle was driven clean into the plaster of the wall. But we didn't think about that at the time, for over our heads, sailing very comfortably through the windy stars, was the ship that had passed the summer in the landlord's field. Her portholes and her bay window were blazing with lights, and there was a noise of singing and fiddling on her decks. He's gone, shouted landlord above the storm, and he's taken half the village with him. I could only nod in answer, not having lungs like the bellows of leather. In the morning, we were able to measure the strength of the storm, and over and above my pigsty, there was damage enough wrought in the village to keep us busy. True it is that the children had to break down no branches for the firing that autumn, since the wind had strewn the woods with more than they could carry away. Many of our ghosts were scattered abroad, but this time, very few came back. All the young men, having sailed with Captain, and not only ghosts, for a poor half-witted lad was missing, and we reckoned that he had stowed himself away, or perhaps shipped as a cabin boy, not knowing any better. What with the lamentations of the ghost girls, and the grumbling of families who had lost an ancestor. The village was upset for a while, and the funny thing was that it was the folk who had complained most of the carryings on of the youngsters who made most noise now that they were gone. I hadn't any sympathy with Shoemaker or Butcher, who ran about saying how much they missed their lads, but it made me grieve to hear the poor, bereaved girls calling their lovers by name on the village green at nightfall. It didn't seem fair to me that they should have lost their men a second time after giving up life in order to join them, as like as not. Still, not even a spirit can be sorry forever. And after a few months, we made up our mind that the folk who had sailed in the ship were never coming back, and we didn't talk about it anymore. And then one day, I dare say it would be a couple of years after, when the whole business was quite forgotten, who should come traipsing along the road from Portsmouth but the daft lad who had gone away with the ship without waiting till he was dead to become a ghost. You never saw such a boy as that in all your life. He had a great rusty cutlass hanging to a string on his waist, and he was tattooed all over in fine colors, so that even his face looked like a girl's sampler. 
He had a handkerchief in his hand full of foreign shells and old-fashioned pieces of small money. Very curious. And he walked up to the well outside his mother's house and drew himself a drink, as if he had been nowhere in particular. The worst of it was that he had come back as soft-headed as he went, and try as we might, we couldn't get anything reasonable out of him. He talked a lot of gibberish about keel-hauling and walking the plank and crimson murders, things which a decent sailor should know nothing about, so that it seemed to me, for all his manners, Captain had been more of a pirate than a gentleman mariner. But to draw sense out of that boy was as hard as picking cherries off a crab tree. One silly tale he had kept on drifting back to, and to hear him, you would have thought it was the only thing that happened to him in his life. We was at anchor, he would say, off an island called the Basket of Flowers, and the sailors had caught a lot of parrots, and we were teaching them to swear, up and down the decks, up and down the decks, and the language they used was dreadful. Then we looked up and saw the masts of a Spanish ship outside the harbor. Outside the harbor they were. So we threw the parrots into the sea and sailed out to fight. And all the parrots were drowned in the sea. And the language they used was dreadful. That's the sort of boy he was. Nothing but silly talk of parrots when we asked him about the fighting. And we never had a chance of teaching him better. For two days after, he ran away again. And hasn't been seen since. That's my story, and I assure you that things like that are happening at Fairfield all the time. The ship has never come back, but somehow as people grow older, they seem to think that one of these windy nights she'll come sailing in over the hedges with all the lost ghosts on board. Well, when she comes, she'll be welcome. There's one ghost lass that has never grown tired of waiting for her lad to return. Every night you'll see her out on the green, straining her poor eyes with looking for the mast lights among the stars. A faithful lass you'd call her, and I'm thinking you'd be right. Landlord's Field wasn't a penny worse for the visit, but they do say that since then, the turnips that have been grown in it have tasted of rum. Thanks for listening, and thank you to my author, Richard Middleton, if you are, if you can hear me somewhere out there. Thank you so much for your contribution of this wonderful story to my show and to just society in general. So if you're new to the show just let you know you can follow the show on twitter instagram facebook all under scary to sleep instagram and twitter are all one word scary to sleep made it pretty easy if you have a story you'd like me to consider putting on the show then please send it to scary to sleep at gmail.com i think a few people have asked me recently how i prefer to receive stories you can send it in a google doc um you can send it in inline text if you need to um yeah, just send it however you need to. Uh, if you can, I would just go over it one more time to proofread it, and that would be great. But that's my only ask, really. Um, and again, I'm backed up pretty far. But, but if you have something you would, if you have a Halloween e episode or story you'd like considered for the Halloween season that's more themed, please send it in and make sure you put in the subject line Halloween story. I cannot guarantee every single one will make it on the show. um, And I can't guarantee that yours will make it on the show. That does not mean it's bad. I just, you know, we're all human. I'm a human. I just have my tastes and have things. There's sometimes, honestly, and this is so, this is completely true. I have come across stories that I love and I've had to not have on the show because of my limited voice acting abilities, um, editing abilities, uh, sometimes it's just a me thing and I promise that's not a (laughs) that sounds like I'm breaking up with you and I'm saying it's me it's not you I promise it's not like that I promise it's there have been stories I've gotten in where it's like 10 different people in a room 
And it's an incredible story about 10 people being trapped underground or in a basement or something. And I did get, I got one like that. And the whole thing was dialogue. And I, again, I am only one person who is not a professional voice actor and I couldn't make it work. I couldn't figure out how to make 10 different people sound different enough so that it wouldn't be completely confusing. Like, and just hearing it in an audio medium with only me would have been, I mean, no one would have known what was going on. It would have sounded like the same person just talking over and over again. Um, so yeah, if you have a story like that, think about that. If you have something that's like dialogue heavy between like more than three people, then I probably won't be able to handle that. <laughs> um, keep sending in kid and teen stories. I've gotten a few of those. Remember, you have until the 30th, so you have time. But yeah, kids and teen stories, put in that subject line, kids and teens. Oh, and speaking of Halloween submissions, if you have any other seasonal submissions, um, I'm going to get better about this, I promise. I, I didn't do great. I haven't done great the last few years about doing this, but if you have a seasonal submission, put in the subject line, like this is a Thanksgiving story. This is a Christmas story. This is a, yeah, Halloween story, a Valentine's Day story. And I'm going to start a seasonal file where I put seasonal stories because I've been really bad in the past about doing things out of season or not seeing them until like the day after Halloween or the day after Valentine's Day. Um, looking into you. Oh God, who was it? Velma? Was it Velma? Who <laughs> had the story about Valentine's and I saw it the week after and I'm so sorry. I still have the story on the show though. Um, Valentine's for Veronica. I think that's what it was called. Yes. Um, but anyway, so yeah, if you would like to do something seasonally, put that, put that, uh, season or holiday in the title. Hey, and if you're from a different country or, and have different holidays and you'd like to write a story about this holiday that I, as an ignorant American, have no idea about, feel free to do that too. And just let me know when that holiday is or season is for you. And I'll try to get it in there for when that is for you. So yeah, I know I have listeners around the world. It is not just about us, the US, as much as many of my <laughs> um, co-Americans think so. Anyway, I am going to Halloween Horror Nights tomorrow. I'm so excited. Um, tomorrow being, well, you'll probably get this Friday. I'm going Friday to the one in Hollywood, and I'm so excited. I haven't been in years. I'm going to go see scary things and hopefully get some inspiration for all of you and come back to tell you lots of scary stories. I wish I had my YouTube channel already. I wish I was able to do that, but I can't do that until the 1st of October for um, legal reasons. And so I w but I'll try to get some video or something put up on, I don't know, Instagram, Facebook, TikTok. I made a TikTok and I did nothing with it. I didn't do anything with it. <sighs> Sorry about that. I'm, I've been a little bit overwhelmed with doing both shows and a few other projects. It's been, it's been a mess over here and I'm only one person. I haven't figured out how to clone myself yet. If you guys have any idea how to do that please let me know. I don't even care if it comes out a little bit messed up, like an extra arm, one less arm. It's fine. I just, I need some help. Um, anyway, I think that's all for tonight. Um, have a spooky weekend. I know I'm going to, uh, if you're going to Halloween Horror Nights tomorrow on Friday, <laughs> say hi. If you see me, I know we'll all be wearing masks and things. So you no one's going to recognize me and not that people even I've never been recognized don't think that I'm saying that I don't that's never happened to me in my entire life and um I don't anticipate it happening but I'm just saying you know if you happen to be there and see me like say hi and it'd be cool um is that doxing myself am I supposed to do that I don't know how to do this whole internet thing I didn't pay attention to any of the stranger danger PSAs from the early 2000s all right, I'm going to go. I love you all. I hope you enjoyed this week's story. I really enjoyed it. I know it was a departure from my usual, but it was, I, I was seriously, I was so happy reading this story. It like, I, it just warmed my like dark little comedy loving heart. And I, I had to have it on the show. I just had to, as soon as I read it, any of my plans for this week went out the window. I was like, this is it. This is the story. I'm so excited. And I have next week, 
since it's the first day of fall next week, um, I will have a fall. It's it's like a story that has to do with the season. See, I'm getting better at seasons. I saw a seasonal story and I said, hey, I'm going to hang on to that for the actual season. Look at me. I'm improving. And my birthday is next week. Me and Stephen King and Sapphire from Stories with Sapphire. Um, we all have the same birthday. It's pretty cool. It's a very spooky birthday, as you can tell. Um, all right. I love you all. Go get some sleep. Sweet dreams.